So welcome back to PLEARN 0006 Introduction to Language. This week we'll be looking at how children acquire their knowledge of language. How do children go from knowing nothing about what language is going to be around them, right? A baby has no idea whether it's going to be born in a society speaking Korean, a society speaking perhaps Mandarin Chinese, or speaking Igbo, or speaking German, or speaking British English. So how does a child go from not knowing anything about that environment to within a couple of years really becoming a perfect member of that speech community. By about age five or so, a baby is a fully fledged member of its speech community, having a pretty much perfect command of the grammar of its language. And of course, as you've seen yourself exploring human language over the last seven weeks, that is no easy task. It's quite a hard problem to figure out. So babies, if you think about it, are really these amazing language learning machines. And we're going to have a look this week at how they do it. So there'll be two videos this week. In the first video, we'll be chronicling the journey that an infant takes when it acquires language. We'll be looking at the various stages of language acquisition that an infant and a young child goes through. And then in the second video, we'll be asking how a child is able to acquire that knowledge. Specifically, we'll be looking at the nature versus nurture debate. Is it about innate knowledge or is it all from external input? Or perhaps the answer lies somewhere in between. So one fact that is perhaps quite surprising to a lot of people is that babies actually start learning about the languages around them before they're born. It turns out that prenatal babies, by about one month from birth, already are able to discriminate its mother tongue from other languages in its surrounding. And we know this because people can go and with ultrasound measure the heart rate of the baby whilst it's in the womb, and then they can play different stimuli from different languages, including the mother tongue, to the baby and see how it reacts. And it turns out the baby reacts differentially to the mother tongue versus other languages that it hasn't been exposed to whilst it was in the mother's womb. Following this, pretty much at birth, we can actually show that babies have a preference for the maternal language, for the language of its mother. So quite clearly it's been paying quite a lot of attention to how its mother has been speaking whilst it was still in the womb. So it would appear that prenatal babies track the rhythm and intonation of the languages that they're exposed to, that they can hear through the amniotic fluid in the womb of its mother. So to give you an idea of the kind of input that a prenatal baby might have, here is a recording of the Vice Chancellor of my alma mater, Bangor University, introducing himself that I've applied a 400 Hertz low pass filter through, which it turns out is a good simulation for the kind of signal that arrives through the amniotic fluid and the body tissue that's in the way when you're in the mother's womb. So chances are you couldn't understand what was really going on, but you might have been able to identify that there is someone speaking English here. So have another listen to this and try and pay attention specifically to the intonation and the rhythm of the speech. And because you're probably itching to know what was said, and you might have a guess at this point even, um, here's the recording, unfiltered, just so you know what the original input was. Hello, my name is John Hughes and I'm the Vice Chancellor of Bangor University. So as you can see, quite a drastic change, but you can still perceive the rhythm. And in actuality, if I play you that sentence with the low pass filter again now, and you listen very carefully, you might notice that you seem to be able to identify much more of the speech than you were previously. <laughs> 
So there's still quite some significant cues in that speech even filtered to about 400 hertz and cutting everything else off. So the first year of life in terms of language acquisition is principally characterized by two pre-linguistic stages. And pre-linguistic here means in terms of production, babies are not able to produce language yet. That doesn't mean that they don't have any linguistically relevant knowledge. Clearly their passive knowledge, their ability to understand is quite some way ahead of their active knowledge, their expressive abilities in the language. And that's actually something that is going to continue throughout and it's perhaps going to continue throughout your life. For example, if you think about your vocabulary, there might be many, many words that if you encounter them, you understand them, but you couldn't come up with the right word in the right situation if you needed it. For example, very technical vocabulary that you've learned in this linguistics course. So at about three months of age, children enter what we call the cooing stage. Cooing really is the stage where babies start to produce the first sounds other than crying. So often these involve individual vowel sounds or also the act of blowing raspberries, which if you're not familiar with that English terminology is where you put your tongue between your lips and make sort of funny noises that way. And just in case you don't happen to have access to a baby that you can observe cooing yourself, here is a little video clip of a baby cooing. And it seems what's happening during this cooing stage is really that babies are starting to learn to get finer motor control of all the articulators that are involved. A lot of these vowel sounds are still quite pressed and there seems to be relatively little control over what the vocal folds do at present, how much pressure is applied from the lungs across the glottis. You learn how to move your tongue in more detail, how to use your lips. And of course, lips are the first articulators that you can identify visually. So babies have very strong cues to know that these are involved in language. So really cueing here is a first attempt to gain finer motor control of all the things that the baby needs to produce language. Now this cooing stage is followed by a stage of babbling, which lasts from about six months until about one year. Babbling is primarily characterized by repetitive CV or CV CV syllables. For example, gaga, baba, dada, and so on. And this is all about the infant exploring the syllable inventory of its language and also starting to apply some intonation. So when you listen to a baby babbling, you can often hear that the baby is kind of responsive and it almost seems, if you didn't pay attention to the missing content of the words, that that baby was having a conversation. And once again, in case you're not exposed to the beauty of a child babbling around you, here's a little clip of a child babbling. So sometime around the one year mark comes this wonderful stage that all parents are looking forward to where a child speaks the first couple of recognizable words of their language. Usually at the start, these are of course very simple consonant vowel CV or CVCV words, which really are sort of the most simple word structure that you can have. So for example, a child trying to say the words sock and shoe might say sa and su. And then of course, they are those two tremendously important first words that every parent is looking forward to hearing, mama and papa. And something really fascinating about these two words, mama and papa, is that in almost every language of the world you find the words mama and papa or something very similar like baba being applied to one of the primary caregivers in the child's environment. And you might ask, why mama and papa? Now, one of my linguistic heroes of the past, Roman Jakobsen, wrote an essay asking exactly that question, why mama and papa? And there is a very good explanation based on how children acquire language. Well, it turns out that first of all, bilabial sounds like m 
and per are the ones, as I've already mentioned, that have a visual clue. So it's very easy for the baby to identify that these sounds figure in the language and how they're produced and what the timing is because it can actually observe what its parents or caregivers are doing when they're speaking to it. Secondly, you might ask, well, why do we get bilabial stops rather than say labial dental fricatives or bilabial fricatives even? Well, that has to do with the fact that a stop is about as much contrast as you can produce to a vowel. If you think about it, a vowel is awfully loud, a lot of acoustic energy. And what is a stop? Well, a stop is complete silence pretty much. So that's the very opposite to that. So you're maximizing the contrast, the cues between a stop and a vowel in the transition are the strongest possible cue of transition that you can get. Then it turns out that the vowel in these words is always the most open vowel that's available in that language. And that of course has to do with the simple fact that that's the easiest to produce. You just produce maximal aperture, you open everything in the vocal folds and that's the sound that will come out. In a way, it's very similar to what babies do when they cry. They open and they get maximum effect by opening their vocal folds and pushing all the air out as much as they can. Lastly, then of course, you might ask why that structure, CV, CV, consonant, vowel, consonant, vowel in mama and papa, well, it turns out, of course, that CV is about the most simple syllable type that you can get. One consonant, one vowel, no structural complexity. And then it turns out you have something like intonation and stress, etc. In most languages, the minimal word that can label content in the world is usually bisyllabic. So there seems to be a very strong inherent bias to its having bisyllabic words. And in fact, all throughout babbling, you observe the children have a preference for bisyllabic babbles. Now another really interesting aspect just before babies reach this stage where they actually start being expressively active in the language, in the late pre-linguistic stage, babies, it turns out, are universal listeners. They're perfectly capable of distinguishing all the sounds in all the world's languages, an ability they very rapidly lose when they enter that stage, that linguistically expressive stage at about one year of age. So let's have a look at a short video clip here showing how Janet Worker was conducting an experiment on babies showing that they are universal listeners by using something that we call the head turn procedure. Infants are born with the flexibility to learn any language. The obscure Indian dialect spoken here is helping psychologist Janet Worker discover when babies lose that potential. Thompson or in language is useful to me because it has a set of consonants that are not used in English. Like, uh, traham and traham. Oh boy, those sound the same to me. Now, can you yeah. say those again? Traham, that's fine. Okay. And traham to secure. Can you say this word, this one I've written down here, which means to fry, and then pronounce the first consonant and vowel? We teach the baby to turn her head when the sound changes. In testing, we can then tell if the baby can hear the sound change because she turns her head in anticipation of the toys coming on. The toys then serve as a reward for a correct head turn. This eight-month-old baby has no trouble anticipating the appearance of the toys. She turns when she hears the sound change. This baby is a year old. For him, the difference in sounds no longer exists. He only turns after the toys have appeared. There's a reorganization in speech perception across the first year of life so that the young infant is born ready to learn any human language and experience then functions to narrow that universal set of abilities, that universal discriminatory ability to be specific to the particular language that the baby is learning. So if you think about it, this is quite an interesting 
fact about this stage of language acquisition, where you're transitioning from being a passive consumer and somebody who's trying to just sort of figure out things to becoming a participant in the language that's around you. And suddenly it turns out in order to be a good speaker of that language, you have to unlearn your ability to discriminate all the languages of the world and you have to start to specialize towards that language. So in any case, returning to the stage where children start to use words of the language around them, we can of course look at the progress that children make, going from sort of little words like sue for shoe, all the way to producing sentences at some stage. And we can measure these stages by referring to something that we call the mean length of utterance. And then of course, we can go and measure the gradual increase over time of the mean length of utterance in children as they progress in their language acquisition. And it turns out that not only does the mean length of utterance increase gradually throughout the development of the child's language, but also the complexity increases gradually. So the child at certain stages will introduce a little bit of morphology and then we'll start to put not only more words together but also have some more syntactic structure. At some point we'll start embedding sentences and then entire clauses. So let's have a little look at the timeline in which children progress in terms of increasing their mean length of utterance and increasing the morphological and structural complexity of the language they use. So from about one to two years of age, the mean length of utterance goes from the one word stage to two word utterances. So children start out with one word things like dada and doggy, and they end up saying things like night night and choo choo, but also things like mummy walk. Sometime between two years and three months and two years and six months, children start to introduce some grammatical morphemes here counted as half a unit of utterance, giving us two to 2.5 in the mean length of utterance. And that's really things like, for example, the possessive marker and doggy can become doggies and having things like prepositions. So now we can say, for example, he have to. This is followed very shortly at about two years and seven months to two years and 10 months by an increase to having about three words and constructing simple sentences. So children at that age might say things like, baby want milk and where mommy go. Then between two years and 11 months and about three years and four months, they start having some sort of simple embedding structures. So they might produce constructions that have more than one verb. For example, I want to play, where play of course is embedded in the matrix clause, I want to, or I saw where Kitty went, where of course we have a very simple embedded relative where Kitty went in the matrix clause, I saw. And then from about three years and five months or about three and a half years of age, children start to produce ever more complex embedding structures, longer sentences, and also conjoined clauses using conjunction and disjunction, for example. So they might say things like, we left and mummy called, or I think we gotta go. From there on, the child really continues increasing complexity, increasing its vocabulary, and also refining the kinds of intersentential relationships that are there and figuring out the sort of subtle grammatical relations and rules that are there. And that takes the child until it's about five years old when it will pretty much have nearly perfected the grammar of its language and have a sizable vocabulary to boot. Now, Roger Brown, who spent a lot of his time observing how children acquire language, made a very interesting observation about how children acquire grammatical markers and function words. They don't just do that in any random order, but rather they seem to all follow the same systematic acquisition pattern. For instance, first they start out acquiring present progressive markers like ing, that's followed by prepositions like in and on. Then they learn about plural inflection. Then they learn the irregular past tense verbs like went and hid. This is followed by possessives and then the copula to be and its variants like am and is. Following the copula, children then learn about articles like a and the before moving on to the regular past tense ed, which of course they then go through a stage of applying to everything, even words that they have previously already learned have a special kind of past tense and they will re-regularize them and maybe say things like goad instead of went. 
Next, they learn about the singular present tense agreement morpheme, the little s that goes at the end of verbs like hits and runs. And this is followed sometime later by learning about the irregular present tense verbs, for example, has and does. So really what this shows us is that language acquisition is not just sort of random and the children soak up whatever and it's just an ability to sort of combine a number of words at any one stage, but rather with the specific kinds of verbs and structures and whatever that they acquire, there is a real systematicity behind that. Perhaps we could go as far as saying the children are looking for specific types of information to figure out things incrementally, that they have a plan of I need to learn this and then I can learn that and then I can learn that. So another thing that's of course quite important to talk about when we're talking about the time scale or the timeline of language acquisition is to talk about the sensitive period. It turns out just like a lot of other biological organisms, there is a predetermined time scale that humans have to acquire certain skills, among them to acquire the ability to have human language. So language acquisition proceeds along a predetermined time scale and as children grow older and enter puberty, they gradually lose their ability to fully acquire language with the same fullness that an infant can acquire the languages that are around. Now, of course, if you're a little older, you can still learn a language and you can come to quite a good command of that language as well. However, you can't learn it in the same way that a child in a sensitive period can learn it. So post-pubescent humans cannot acquire language to the full extent that younger children can. For example, one thing that is almost impossible to get right if you're learning a language later in life, and this is even true if you're already 10 or 11 years old when you start learning that language, is to become an accent-free speaker of that language. And accent-free here, of course, means within the community where you're learning that language, sharing the exact same accent of that group so that members of that group won't be able to pick out that you don't belong to that group. So of course, if we want to study the sensitive period and the sort of impact that it might have on a human's language ability if they don't get linguistic input, we can't just go and deprive some random human being of all sort of linguistic input. That would be tremendously cruel and deeply unethical. However, as sad as it is, there are cases of children that do in fact grow up without any linguistic input. Usually in the case of feral children, this involves a very, very abusive relationship from the caregivers. So for example, in the case of Jeannie, who is somewhat famous in linguistic circles and who was confined by her father to a small room when she was about one year and eight months of age and kept there until she was rescued at 13 years and seven months of age. During that time, she was strapped into a seat permanently so she couldn't move. Um, all linguistic contact was forbidden and of course she didn't have any sort of real social interaction. She was extremely deprived of sunlight, of movement. She had malformations of her body. She was really underdeveloped. There are lots and lots of problems, not just linguistically. Now, when she was finally rescued at 13 years and seven months, she was basically non-linguistic. She had little to no understanding of the language that was around her and she wasn't able to really produce any language. And so the team of people that looked after her was joined by Susan Curtis, who was at the time a PhD student of the author of the textbook, Victoria Frumkin. And Susan Curtis worked intensively with Jeannie trying to teach her English, but also keeping track of the linguistic development that Jeannie had. And what happened was that while Jeannie was able to acquire quite a sizable vocabulary, her syntax and morphology remained very poor, no matter the amount of teaching effort that was made, the sentences that she produced were always very, very deficient in terms of the morphosyntax that's involved. For example, she would produce sentences like man motorcycle have, genie full stomach, and open door key. And although, as you might discover if you research the story of genie a little bit further, there are some more complications and eventually we couldn't follow up with what happened, it seems that genie was essentially unable to ever progress past that stage of language acquisition after having missed language acquisition very early on in her life. So to summarize what we've seen here, first of all, we've seen that language acquisition is very highly systematic. Children don't just acquire random chunks of language, put them together and eventually figure out the system, but they go about it in a very, very systematic way. 
fashion. In fact, language acquisition seems to proceed along a biologically predetermined schedule with distinct stages of acquisition where children have distinct tasks. They're trying to figure out distinct things about language that they're learning and becoming proficient at. Humans, moreover, have a sensitive period, a window for first language acquisition, which fades around puberty. And while, of course, as I've said earlier, older humans can still acquire additional languages, they can't do that to the same extent that young children can. And the process, in fact, might work differently, even though second language acquisition is not something that we'll be looking at here specifically. So now that we have a good idea of sort of the timeline of acquisition of how a child develops its language, we have to ask the question, how is it that a child is able to acquire all that knowledge in the first place? And that's exactly what we were looking at in the second video. So I'll see you over there in a second.